Last time, we visualized linear second-order differential equations in a phase plane by putting it in the form of ddt of capital X is equal to a times capital X. And we showed that the eigenvalues and eigenvectors of this matrix A determine the big picture dynamics we can expect to see. Now in this final video of this series, we're going to dive a bit deeper and talk about nonlinear second order differential equations. But before we get started, let's remind ourselves why we're even doing this. Linear equations like the spring mass damper system are nice because they're solvable and simple. But in reality, nature plays by its own rules. The damping constant is very rarely actually constant, and a real spring force can sometimes be modeled more accurately with a cubic term rather than just a linear term. And it turns out that even fairly simple nonlinear differential equations can give rise to really interesting and complicated dynamics that just can't be captured with linear differential equations. So with that in mind, let's study one of the simplest nonlinear differential equations, a damped pendulum. The angle theta of this pendulum is given by the differential equation theta double dot plus mu theta dot plus g on l sine theta is equal to zero. Now this sine theta term here is what causes this equation to be nonlinear. What's typically done in a first year physics course is to use a small angle approximation and just write sine theta is approximately equal to theta. But we're not going to do that. We're going to analyze the full equation and we're going to start by doing what we did last time. Let's define the angular velocity theta dot equal to some variable I'll call omega. And so that means that omega dot is equal to minus mu omega minus g on l sine theta. We do this so that we can break up our second order differential equation into a system of first order differential equations. Now we can visualize our solution by abstractly thinking of it as a particle in a vector field again. Remember, each one of these arrows denotes a velocity of our particle, which has a horizontal component in this case equal to theta dot, and a vertical component equal to omega dot. Now admittedly, I'm kind of cheating here at the moment, because I'm using my computer to simulate each vector and initial condition here. But even without using my black box of a computer, it's still possible to extract key qualitative features of this flow, which is ultimately what we care about. So let's do that now. Ideally, what we would like to do is express our system of equations in the form DDT of capital X is equal to A times capital X, like we did last time where in this case, capital X is a vector containing the elements theta and omega. But try as you like, there is no way you can put this system of differential equations in this form with A being a constant. It just can't happen. So, what can we do? Well, let's take a look at our first video about one-dimensional flows for some motivation. What we did there was approximate the curve as a line at places of zero velocity, and that gave us key insights into the dynamics near that fixed point. Let's try the same technique, but with two-dimensional flows. Now, I'll focus on the math in a separate video, but it turns out that by first solving for the fixed points and then linearizing about these fixed points by using a Taylor series and truncating the higher order terms, we can get our equation in the very useful form DDT of capital X is equal to A times capital X. This is great news because as we showed last time, we can solve this and quantify the dynamics near our fixed points. So, let's go back to our vector field again and see what this all means. Well, these points here are our fixed points. It's where our fluid has zero velocity. Theta dot is equal to zero, and omega dot is equal to zero. And what we just showed mathematically is that our equation of motion can be approximated near these fixed points as a bunch of separate linear differential equations. 
And that means that the flow in a tight region around these fixed points obeys the linear dynamics that we explored last time. Here you can see this fixed point is a stable spiral, this is a saddle, this is a stable spiral, this is a saddle, and this one is a stable spiral. Now I should clarify that an important limitation of linearization is that it can only ever illuminate the dynamics near the fixed points, leaving the exact global dynamics unknown. But regardless, this is still very valuable, in part because we can determine regions of stability. For example, if we started our pendulum swing from rest close to zero degrees, then we'll get a nice, stable spiral like you're seeing here. But if we release the pendulum from rest near 180 degrees, then because this is near an unstable saddle fixed point, it will explode away until it reaches some other stable fixed point like you're seeing here. Now you might be asking, well, hey, did we really need any of this linearization theory to understand the motion of this pendulum? Can't we infer the dynamics from common sense? Well, in the case of a pendulum, you absolutely can. But what about the famous van der Poel equation? This famous nonlinear differential equation that I showed at the start of the series is used to model a certain electrical circuit, and it's not immediately obvious what the dynamics will look like in advance. But if we apply the same linearization technique that we showed earlier, then we can at least get a little bit of useful qualitative information about the dynamics. In this case, it tells us that our origin is unstable as long as this mu term is greater than zero. And so if we go back to our vector field, we can confirm exactly that. Our fixed point at the origin is an unstable spiral, and that's something that might otherwise have been very hard to predict. And there we have it, we've learnt the core details about linearization. It's a very powerful method, but it's by far not the only method. There is so much more. Like, how can we prove if there's a limit cycle? And how will the dynamics change if you vary certain parameters? These types of questions require entirely different theoretical tools, and have a massive implication for engineering and physics as a whole but we'll talk about that in a future series. For now, this is just a small introduction to nonlinear dynamics, and I hope you enjoyed it. Cheers.